All right, we're going to go back in time and talk about some pre-Columbus existences and civilizations in the Massachusetts, Rhode Island area. And there are a lot of different theories, some relating to St. Lawrence civilization, the Northmen, Scandinavians, a lot of different things. Whether this is from the 10th century or beyond, we don't know. And this is the Dighton Rock in Massachusetts, which also has a lot of mysterious petroglyphs surrounding it. And this is the Newport Old Mill nowadays. This is what it looks like now. I mean, it's pretty impressive. It's nothing too incredibly fancy, but it is definitely an old relic. And theories were abound all throughout time of this, and it was a cultural phenomenon and written about in books, talked about in stories all over the place, and people would come and see it and speculate about it, and supposedly 99% of the locals just didn't really believe in the uh, stories. They just kind of went about their daily business and knew about this place, but whether it's a mill, I don't really know. It seems like something a lot older and it points towards other buildings and ruins of the same type of structure that were around in Ireland, Britain, all over the place around the 12th century. So it's really mysterious. No one's really sure, but we're going to theorize about it. And many books have been written about it and you, they don't really know. There's a lot of people that really think that Throughout time, people should have been focusing more attention on this building and trying to get to the bottom of it because it holds some incredible mystery about the pre-Columbus civilization. And there's the Chinese theory, a Portuguese theory, medieval Templars theory. There are a lot of different theories going around, and so uh, it's, it's time to talk about them. Now, Newport is also becoming notorious for Fort Adams, which is an amazing star fort. Now they have the uh, Newport Folk Festival here and a bunch of other events. We actually vended our art here one time and it was an amazing feeling. It was great to like spend time around it. such an amazing structure. And that's a readout that they found and they claim is for defense purposes. There's a really rich house around the uh, area, a really old house. These walls are huge. I parked right around here and just it really you can tell it's something magnificent and you know everyone that you talk about just like shrugs it off as just like oh whatever it was a Ford blah 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 they go by the story and this is the underground photos and there's a lot of I guess underground pathways and different things there's no telling I would love to explore this and recommend anyone try it I don't really know what the uh, deal is but go for it it's a cool area great water around there really great great place now here are some of the books used. You can find them on archive.org. History of Rhode Island, Newport, Antiquitatis Americana, which has some controversy around it. Septentrionales, that area in North America. I love that name. It's a great word. And uh, Discovery of America by the Northmen in the 10th century from Scandinavian origins, where they've known, lived around, or came around here and stayed for a while. And the controversy touching the old stone mill of Newport, because there was a lot of controversy and a lot of people loved it. And it was referred to by this author as a singular stone structure which has from an immemorial period defied alike the tooth of time and the wits of antiquarians. And antiquarians used to come from all over and theorize about this and the locals made songs about it and they just went about their daily business and didn't really care. And so they called it the Round Tower, the Newport Ruin, and Old Stone Mill. And inevitably the Danish antiquarians um, proposed a lot of different theories about it and they had they were very highly respected at the time. They suggest that it's a superstructure of a baptistery connected with a church and built by the Northmen who visited Massachusetts and Rhode Island in the 10th century. And they know that they have visited here by geological, astronomical, and nautical evidence in these things called the parchment papers which they've preserved from the 10th century. And so there's a lot of different theories about that. That in a lot of, but there's also kind of controversy that maybe the Scandinavians planted some of this, but who knows? The Newport settlers came in about 1638, but they did not have any clear evidence that survived that said who built it. So the curiosity continued, and in 1832, Professor Scrobine dug around the mill and under it and proved supposedly that it was of Scandinavian origin and it was a relic. And around this time, a skeleton in armor that was broken and corroded. It was found in the mid-1800s in Fall River, and it was of very mysterious origins. No one really knew, but there could have been armies here. There could have been a lot of people here, and they might have found that and a lot more throughout time and then taken it. Who knows? If you read this and some of these other pages, you can see the song about the yeah, skeptics and the believers of the uh, skeleton story and its ancient origins. And so the controversy begins. And the author calls on scientists to study the origins before the truth is lost forever because they can feel that the truth is going to be lost soon enough and that nobody's going to report these true facts and it'll just get lost in time. 
So the talks of other structures, temples, and forts that exist in St. Lawrence civilizations in ages prior to its pretended discovery by Columbus. So a lot of people knew that Columbus didn't discover this, and there were a lot of civilizations that existed way before that. So they speak of all kinds of other structures and ancient relics that existed, like temples, forts, Dighton Rock, towers, even these immense mounds, which lie in direct line from north to south Massachusetts. I'm definitely going to look more into that. But they all basically show that a race of very skilled beings in arts once existed on this continent around 1070 to 1075, they can date it. And um, they believe that under the center was the receptimum, is what they called it. A lot of people believe it really was a baptistry and a baptismal area, and they would collect the waters above, probably from the rainwaters, which they considered sacred or something, and then they would shower upon them in a baptismal shower. And that was it kind of represents the firmament, if you think about it, with the waters above and getting blessed with it. I can't, can't imagine what they were thinking, but it sounds amazing. So they believe the rest of the structure was eroded throughout time and maybe it was of wood and connected to a lot of other things that could have burned down and that's just the last part that remained. So it's possible the Northmen were here from the 10th to the 14th century and then after that Roger Williams came in with a bunch of settlers and some coins have been found in this area that supposedly date to Henry II in 1160 which points that this area may have been a very commerce oriented area which is noticeable by the water that's around it and the waterways and the, the great area that it's in. So some authors that have dug deep into this propose that there are three possible races that were here before Columbus and one of them refers to it that they're possibly the ancient Egyptians and the Persians who came over here before the time and that these Norsemen saw ancient relics from their civilization before and were talking about them and documenting them in their records which is ridiculous and that a lot of the carvings may have been here way before the Christian era in the 10th century and uh, you never know the Egyptians they may have been able to go everywhere I wouldn't put it past them I definitely believe they could now these talks about the northern and Scandinavian regions and the people that sprang from them even Thracius mentioned by Homer is in here in an area that was now extinct. So they have a lot of different theories about who might have been here before and how different races wanted to claim ownership of these pre-Columbian sites. So they would occasionally kind of fub some, uh, some of the relics and some of the evidence. Now, it's really a toss-up between whether these books were just trying to d get rid of those ancient theories and say that people that thought about them were crazy and were just kind of for forging the evidence. But I tend to believe a lot of these ancient possibilities because they're from other sources that seem very uh, seem very great and it's these things kind of seem like they're from that era. Oftentimes European scholars and antiquarians would receive drawings that were sent over and the art artists would embellish the drawings so a lot of times they were basing some of their judgment and some of their research off of false drawings so that was another factor that in, that kind of clouded the uh, judgment of the true history. And this just kind of shows some of the stories that it was mentioned in. It had kind of a mythical folklore and character to it. And people would travel from all over the place and kind of see it because in the area there were a lot of notorious, mysterious kind of rock structures and that you didn't really know. And so to claim it as a uh, mill, as a windmill, seems very bizarre because there's a very few evidence that they were creating windmills at this time in this area. Now they were doing it in England and the Dutch and Netherlands and whatnot, but not really around here. This seems like something totally different. It really does seem like it's just part of a castle. And in Ireland there's very similar shapes. That is a very cool geometric pattern and it seems like just, you know, all these could just be parts of other things. The archway, the patterns of the columns, the strength of it, the fact that it's still surviving today is pretty impressive. The circular characteristic, if it is a baptismal shower, could be something totally different. That tower could have gone very high, could have had some kind of incredible roof structure, some kind of, uh, who knows, it might go even deeper than they've ever come to dig up because they supposedly did an 18 something, but who knows. These columns aren't necessarily as masterful as Piranesi's drawings and around those times and the Greek constructions and Romans, but, or whoever they were, Phoenicians, but they're still pretty impressive. Great patterns and very cool. Now this Dighton Rock is a whole nother beast, a 40-ton boulder covered in mysterious petroglyphs. Many people came from all over the place and theorized about this, took pictures of it, created artwork of it. Some people made casts of it, but so many people were trying to decipher this because they didn't know if it was Native American 
or something way deeper. And so there are a bunch of different books about it and they're pretty good. They go into a lot of depth about it and they're very interesting. And people were even taking nighttime photographs of it using the flashlight technique so that they could get all the different crevices. And supposedly that was a very interesting technique to be able to get all the little crannies and capture the parts that you may not be able to see in the bright daylight. So they did every method possible and this picture has all the different kinds of things on it if you were to cover them all in. So it looks like it could have been many different people over time. This is one of those flashlight pictures. But it could have been many other people over time that just kept adding to this and telling different stories. And A lot of books, and this one in particular, kind of believes that it was deciphered, that a lot of these were deciphered. While many people still believe it's incredibly mysterious and they don't really know. It was supposedly found near the Taunton River, which is an area I lived at one point, and people were making oil paintings, plaster casts of it, and just really trying to research it and figure out what was happening here. So, so many people had different theories, and there are five that I'll mention here. One is that a Portuguese explorer named Miguel Corterial, who disappeared off of Newfoundland in 1502, had somehow made his way down here in one of his boats with some of his men, and he eventually became leader of the Indians, landed here, and carved on this rock in 1511. You can see one part that kind of shows his name. And so it was found inevitably the edge of the Taunton River, and they thought a lot of his other men had died, and inevitably his story had died, and so this could have been the continuation of his missing story from 1502. But who knows? Another theory is that an English fisherman named Thatcher visited this rock in 1592 and just carved some stuff. Another theory suggests that it illustrates directions on how to find spring water and was carved by the Taunton Haymakers in 1640. Another one suggests that it was the education of Indians on how to write stone records and someone taught them how to do this and then they started doing it all over the place and this is kind of their explanation for how they learned to do stone carvings, although I think that's pretty obvious that that was from a long time ago. And uh, it may just be Native American doodles, you never know. So this is an early drawing, which is in big text from the uh, Reverend John Danforth. And he was one of the first kind of pioneers in the 1680s that really was looking into this. And you know, some of these things look like aliens or different things that you find in petroglyphs in the West. So I don't know if it was connected there. You never really know. And this is some different views of the rock where it lies now, I guess. And uh, it's pretty impressive that it's still here and that it had all these things. You know, who knows what they were carved into it. I'd like to take a deeper look and really see if you can kind of discover something that maybe people got mistaken or lost throughout time. Some look like markings I've seen before. But here are some other places that were uh, around this area that like the Mark Rock Cliffs, the Tiverton Boulders which have inscriptions on them. There's a place called Arnold's Point Cupstone which were sometimes called the Devil's Holes. So a lot of, I guess, throughout time during when they have found mysterious things that they couldn't really understand, they'd often refer to it as the devil's thing, like the devil's tower in Wyoming or all these different devil's structures. <laughs> they would just do it all the time because they feared it and they didn't know who, who did it. It was probably a sign of some ancient cultures that you just couldn't understand and their preachers were telling them, it's the devil or whatnot. But there are a lot of different things that existed around these times and a lot of them are unknown. The Hammond tablets. These are pretty impressive. I want to look deeper into these, but one shows a mammoth and uh, another, like, they're not even sure but what these things are. I definitely don't know what civilization could have done these, but mammoths, you know, maybe there were mammoths around that time, or is it some kind of forgery? Who not? Like, some guy that was trying to gain some popularity at the time with a new theory, has a new book out, writes some kind of thing. I don't know could also point to all these ancient civilizations and that's what I'd like to believe because I really do feel that people were here a long time ago and that we know nothing about it. You know, everybody that interprets history puts their own personal spin on it. They, you really can't help it. And you know, were these things really this primitive? You know, were they just spray, like making little kind of characters or was it something so much more just important? And this whole area is very bewildering and mind-blowing, which makes me think of John Levy and a few other people's research who report that the coastlines are a construction of some civilization. And I really believe the Cape is something spectacular on its own because it is just so unique in the way that it curls up. It's almost like part of a spiral of land. There's something amazing about it and the, the shores are very protective and they protect Plymouth and all these other areas that are pretty important around Massachusetts. There's even a nuclear plant over there. 
and some of the only beings that were around back in the day are the animals. And if they could talk, maybe they'd be able to tell us a little bit about the people who existed in this area beforehand. And, you know, there's star forts all over the place, and, you know, were those civilizations in tune with the animals? I really wonder. The cape is something definitely constructed, I believe, by some ancient civilization. Florida, another similar place with its star fort way at the end of the Florida Keys. And the animals down there are unbelievable, and they, they're very mythological and were portrayed by a lot of different art back then, but there were a lot of Tartarian or ancient roots, maybe even Egyptian in Florida. They probably loved that place because it was similar to Egypt's climate. And uh, you know, I've been getting into kind of drawing these little worlds and these little neon things and incorporating Tartarian structures in it. And oftentimes I'll include and incorporate uh, different animals as you'll see in a little bit. But these things are just little fun worlds and this is just shows kind of the influence that Tartaria and these thoughts, these ancient civilizations have had on my uh, on my psyche as an artist. I really do feel that this pathway of thought that we're doing is really taking us to some new depths of thought as a community, as a culture, you know, this is something big. Just like the flat earth, it points to something so great and divine right in our neighborhoods and in our cities and all these things and they're free to go see and take pictures of and research. And it all requires a long overdue revision of history. And these people in the 1600s were craving it. They knew that in time these things would get lost because it probably happened so much back then. You know, just the things get buried, people forget, things don't get written, and if they do, they don't get published enough for people to really know. And so it, we really can't let it happen. And it's great that we're all digging all of these amazing pieces of the puzzle together. And I love this community. Thank you all for enjoying these videos. Bless you all. Have a great one.